Great. Hey, good, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to a CMBA, Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association, uh, hot talk. Uh, my name is Mike Unger. I have the privilege of moderating today's uh, event from the uh, comfort of the kitchen of my home. Hopefully, I will not be disturbed by uh, Zeus, the Bernese mountain dog, who may intrude at, uh, at any moment. Um, today's, uh, ha oh, first, a uh, uh, housekeeping uh, issue. Please submit any questions that you might have via Q&A uh, on your computer screen. If anybody has any questions about that, you can contact uh, CMBA uh, communi Communications. Michael, can you give the uh, email address for that again? Yeah, so if you have any issues or have any questions that you can't send via the Q&A, you can send it to communications at clemetrobar.org. Great. Thank you very much. So look, as everybody knows, um, federal and state emergency legislation that was signed just recently means that hopefully there is some relief on the way for our business community, for our employers, for our employees, communities, households, uh, and the like. And the plan today is to have this august group explain uh, what funds might be available, what funds are being distributed, um, and how the rules are changing, um, et, et cetera, and how it will work in Ohio uh, and across the, the nation. I will introduce uh, my, my fellow panel members momentarily. They are Brian Broadbent, the CEO of Business Volunteers Unlimited, BVU, as many of us know it. Uh, Melissa Jones from the Franz Ward Law Firm, Claire Wade Kiltz from uh, Sobel, Wade, and, and, and Mapley. And again, I just want to welcome everybody uh, to this uh, webinar. For those who are members of the CMBA and those that have witnessed uh, the fine work of the CMBA uh, previously, thank you for joining. For those of you who may be uh, newbies, you're all going to have an opportunity to see uh, what the rest of us already know, frankly, um, which is that the Cleveland Metropolitan Bar Association is a true thought leader uh, and community leader and, um, um, and, and really has the, the compass of the community in mind when it comes to helping make the public aware of important developments, especially in the wake of coronavirus, as our uh, wonderful um, uh, CEO, Becky McMahon, put it in an email to me uh, earlier today, uh, quote, helping folks survive the surreal, close quote. I've also heard it described as uh, aptly so as weathering a storm uh, for which there is no radar, and I certainly think that's uh, correct. So again, this program is part of an ongoing effort by the CMBA. If you have any questions about what's going on at the CMBA, just visit uh, the website. It is chock full of uh, incredibly helpful information. Uh, and I just want to take this opportunity as a, as a former president, uh, uh, someone who went from a who's that to a who's who very quickly, because I was president a long time ago, uh, I want to commend uh, the current CMBA president, Ian Friedman, and again, our amazing uh, uh, CEO, Becky McMahon, uh, and frankly, the entire staff uh, for their nimble leadership in getting programs like this out to the community. Uh, so without further ado, let me take a moment and introduce our, uh, our wonderful panel members who work so hard and so fast to put this thing together. Uh, first, Brian Broadbent. Uh, Brian has been the Chief Executive Officer of BVU, Bill Business Volunteers Unlimited, for 15 years. Uh, he spent 27 years with Arthur Anderson and Accenture uh, in the latter part as Global HR Director for various groups. He consults with nonprofits on things like success, and hopefully we've got a good contingent of nonprofits uh, uh, watching this today. Um, he consults with nonprofits on things like succession planning, executive trans transitions, mergers and acquisitions, and strategy. Um, he's a wonderful guy, very active in the community, serves on the board of the City Mission, Youth Opportunities Unlimited, multiple foundations, um, and the Commission for Economic Inclusion. Um, he, is a, he is a Shaker resident, I am told, like me, he is sequestered with his uh, wonderful wife, and uh, not a Bernese Mountain Dog, but a Bull Mastiff, name of which is, Brian? I 
one here from George. He's in the kitchen. George, George yeah. the Bullmaster. <laughs> exactly. um, and and by the way, just a just a, a a bit of a plug for BBU for for a second. Um, many of us know of its wonderful work. It serves 120 businesses and 800 nonprofits annually, uh, strengthening not not for profit boards, not for profit operations, and making it easier for uh, folks in our community to volunteer. They have a line of sight to the issues of nonprofits. Uh, during this crisis and uh, as you're about to see uh, got, have plenty to share and hopefully you will find it uh, to be informative. Uh, Melissa Jones uh, is right there. Melissa is a partner at uh, Franz Ward. She represents businesses in all facets of creditors rights including credit management, enforcement and recovery uh, and the like. She focuses her, pra her approach on practical advice with a risk management analysis designed to create avoidance strategies. I wish I could take credit for putting this panel together, but I cannot. Whoever did um, must have been aware of the fact that she's a visionary. Uh, and I say that because I have personal knowledge of this, Melissa. According to my research, her last published article from February of this year, just, just seems like a long time ago, it's not, is entitled, wait for it, Managing the Unexpected. Am I right, Melissa? That was the title of the article you just wrote before coronavirus hit. You can't make that stuff up. Um, and by the way, she included tips to minimize and man manage risks and surprises uh, when confronting uh, uh, those surprises. And uh, so spot on and makes you the perfect, perfect person to be on this panel. And last but not least, I wanna introduce Claire Wade Kiltz, who is a partner and a founding member of the law firm Sobel Wade and Mapley. Um, she uh, founded that firm to help ensure equality and fairness in the workplace. She represents individuals who've experienced discrimination, harassment, retaliation in the workplace before the EEOC, the Ohio Civil Rights Commission, and before various state and federal courts. I did a little research on her before we got on and she's been quite active in that regard. Uh, Claire also advocates for women who are paid less than their male counterparts and women who face sexual harassment in the workplace. Um, her involvement in the Cleveland legal community is especially important to her as she was recognized as the new member of the year by the CMBA Lawyer Referral Service and was selected to the 2018 Ohio Rising Stars. Now, um, I did a little research on her as well, and transitioning from one of our panel members who manages the unexpected to one who encounters and deals with the unexpected, my research has disclosed that Claire is a proud member. She's really worried about what's going to come out of my mouth next. She's a proud member of a group called the Tough Mutters. Am I right? Yeah. And that means she participates in competitions with some very interesting titles, in, including, but not limited to, Rugged Maniac. <clears throat> now we know if, if, if Claire is the type who crawls in the mud over and under barbed wire fences, she's more than capable of tackling the legal issues surrounding uh, coronavirus. So with that, I am going to kick it off to our, uh, to our panel member. I think we're gonna start with a, uh, an overview by Brian, am I right? We're going to go Melissa or Claire. We're going to kick it off. I don't Got know it. What wanted to do it. Okay. Melissa or Claire? I'll get us started. Great. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'm going to talk about the Family First Coronavirus Response Act. Before I get to that, I wanted to share a couple resources with everyone. So in addition to the uh, CMBA website, uh, Littler has put together a collection of COVID-19 resources for employers, and my firm has put together a similar collection for employees. So um, in addition to that CMBA website, these are two good places to go for more resources. So the Family First Coronavirus Response Act goes into effect tomorrow. 
and it's going to remain into, in effect until the end of the year. And this act is what provides for paid sick leave and expanded FMLA. And I'll be referring to that as FMLA plus. So unlike regular FMLA, FMLA plus applies to all employers who have um, fewer than 500 employees. And there is an exemption for employers that have fewer than 50 employees. Um, and the Department of Labor just issued some regulations or FAQs over the weekend that explains this. And I put that up because this is a, kind of a long explanation. So uh, this is the extensive small business exemption for those that have fewer than 50 employees. What's interesting about this FAQ is that this exemption does not apply to both FMLA plus and paid sick leave. It applies only to FMLA plus and one provisions of paid sick leave. Therefore, uh, employers with fewer than 50 employees will still have to uh, participate in the paid sick leave provisions. So unlike existing FMLA, where you have to be employed for over a year or a year um, for your employer, covered employers for FMLA plus and paid sick leave only need to be employed for 30 days. And this applies to both full-time and part-time employees. So in addition to regular FMLA that's still available, there is now um, FMLA plus, which is the 12 weeks of job protected leave to care for a minor child if you're, if they're, school or place of care has been closed for COVID-19 reasons. It also provides for the 80 hours of paid sick leave. And there are six different provisions for paid sick leave. Share those with you here. Um, what's interesting about this is number five looks a lot like FMLA plus. It provides for paid sick leave to care for a son or daughter who's um, school or place of care has been closed because of COVID-19. Well, and this means that you can take paid sick leave for two weeks plus an additional 10 weeks of paid FMLA plus. Work it's interesting is how this FMLA plus intersects with existing FMLA. According to the Department of Labor, you cannot take more than 12 weeks of FMLA and FMLA plus. So if during the previous 12 months, you've already taken 10 weeks of FMLA, you're only eligible for two more weeks of FMLA plus. However, if you exhausted all of your FMLA, you're still eligible for the two weeks of paid sick leave. So how much of this leave is paid? Under existing FMLA, the 12 weeks are unpaid and they remain unpaid. However, under FMLA plus, the first two weeks of leave are unpaid, but the next 10 weeks are paid um, at two thirds of your regular pay rate, up to $200 a day. Um, and you're to be paid for the hours you would have worked. This includes overtime hours. And the two, two weeks of paid sick leave are for up to 80 hours. These don't include overtime. And if you're a part-time employee, you're gonna be paid for the hours you would have normally worked. And going back to that list of six reasons one might take paid sick leave, if your paid sick leave is related to reasons number one, two, or three, you're entitled to five, your full rate of pay up to $500, $511 per day. And if your um, sick leave is related to four, five, or six, then you are entitled to two thirds of your normal rate of pay up to $200 a day. The Department of Labor has also provided guidance on intermittent leave for FMLA plus and paid sick leave. Intermittent leave is when you do not take the days in a row, but you come to work one day and not on another. 
So if you're teleworking, your employer may agree that you can take your paid sick leave or FMLA plus on an intermittent basis. However, if you're going to a work site, once you begin taking that paid sick leave, you have to continue taking that paid sick leave um, until it expires or you can return to work. And the reason for this is they don't want people who are potentially infected or caring for someone that's potentially infected with COVID-19 to come back to the workplace and infect others. And if you're working at the work site and you're on FMLA Plus, you can do that intermittently if your employer allows it. Uh, want to make a couple other notes. Um, this pay is not retroactive. So if you've been staying at home to care for a child because their school has been closed, or if you've been home because you're sick, you're not going to get paid for the time you've already taken off. This is only going to be starting tomorrow. If your place of employment shut down, you're not eligible for this leave. It's only for those that can't work because of the child care or sickness. And employers may pay you more than allowable under this, but they will not be reimbursed um, for the additional pay. And like existing leave under FMLA, an employee must be returned to her position or a similar one when she returns from leave. However, if an employer has fewer than 25 employees, they do not have to restore you to your original position if it no longer exists because of COVID-19. So what happens if your employer's not giving you uh, this paid leave and you believe you're entitled to it? You can contact the Department of Labor, uh, Wage and Hour Division, uh, dol.gov. Um, they're enforcing this. Or if your employer has 50 or more employees, you can also file a lawsuit against them like you could under um, traditional FMLA. And with the paid sick leave, you have the same remedies you would have under um, minimum wage violations, um, the Fair Labor Standards Act. Um, in addition to um, the Family First Coronavirus Response Act, um, there is the CARES Act, and I believe Melissa is going to be telling us more about that. Uh, thank you, Claire. <clears throat> so, what I'm going to be doing today is going through an overview of the CARES Act. <coughs> and this is a very high level overview because it is um, very detailed. Uh, but what I'm trying to do is focus this on a more practical approach based on the questions that we have been receiving nonstop from our clients within the past four days. Uh, so if there's any specific questions that anybody has, it's not addressed in this high level overview by all means. I think there's the Q&A button. Um, you can submit questions or I'm sure any of us are available uh, after the summer to answer questions that you might have. So <clears throat> the first question that I have been receiving is who actually qualifies for the Paycheck Protection Program of the CARES Act? And that's what my focus on right now is the Paycheck Protection Program, which is essentially the loans that are available to small businesses and nonprofit organizations, um, which can be forgiven entirely 100% provided certain regulations and requirements are followed. So it's almost a grant program if um, all the rules are followed but there's a lot of details and nuances. So first of all, who qualifies for this funding? Um, it is businesses which do not employ more than 500 employees or nonprofits, and by nonprofits, that's typically a 501c3 or a 501c19 that employs uh, 500 employees or less. There's also veterans associations, tribal associations. Uh, those are also covered by who is eligible to receive monies under the Pay Paycheck Protection Program or the PPP as we're calling it. Um, but these are the two main areas. It's the businesses of less than 500 employees or the nonprofits. <clears throat> There's also some standards regarding SBA existing regulations on what an actual size um, for a specific industry. So, but that's a very specific issue, but something you should just be aware of. Importantly, this also covers sole proprietors, independent contractors, self-employed, or gig workers. These are the Uber drivers, the Lyft drivers. Uh, those types of individuals are also eligible to receive monies under the PPP. The next question I'm hearing a lot uh, is, how much can I borrow? How do I figure this out? Well, per the act, there is a, 
a choice that you can choose. It is the lesser of the sum of the average monthly payroll cost for the one year period ending on the date that the loan was made times 2.5 or 250% plus any other disaster loan that is uh, being refinanced into the PPP. Those are your idols. We can talk about that, but the idols can be refinanced into the PPP. So that would be considered in your calculation of how much you can borrow or $10 million. So it's the lesser of these, those two calculations. So the next question I'm receiving is, well, what is an actual payroll cost? <clears throat> How do I determine what is a payroll cost for making this computation? And I provided a list here on the slide, um, but essentially it's wages, commissions, salaries, uh, tips, but importantly, this also includes the benefits that the employer is providing for vacation, parental, family, medical, sick leave, um, group health care benefits, including premiums that are being paid by the employer. That's included in that calculation as well, as well as retirement benefits. So those are very key issues to keep in mind. It's not just your wages, not just the salaries, it's all these other benefits and some taxes, and I have the list here. Um, that are also included in that actual calculation of what is a payroll cost that I'm using to calculate on my 2.5 or 250%. Hey, Melissa, it's Mike. Can I just interject a, yes, of course. a, a question from our audience? Someone mm -hmm. um, asked, and it seems like the appropriate time to uh, introduce it. Someone asked the following quote, with respect to an LLC that has no W-2 or 1099 mm -hmm. people, for example, just two owners, how do you answer the question of how many employees the company has? Is it zero or is it two? Well, it depends. Are they receiving payments and distributions? That has been a topic of question is, does a distribution to a member of an LLC count as a wage commission or salary? Well, let's, um, assume, let's, let's assume, let's the, assume, the, the author of that question doesn't elaborate, but let's assume that that's the way it, normally an LLC works and assume that that's the way the members of the LLC are compensated. They receive sure. distributions of profits. Right. And the way, that way, okay, and the way the act is currently drafted, it would seem to exclude those types of distributions. However, it is an area that's unclear. And one thing that is clear is that there is a lot of gray area, poor drafting or questions that are in the current version of the act. And that's not an accusation in any way, shape or form. It's been admitted by the drafters where they realize there's going to be poor drafting areas. However, the push to get this through to make the funding available was critical and they will be um, addressing some of these more specific issues. But the way it is currently drafted as we understand it, is a distribution to an owner of an LLC would not fall in the category of what is considered a payroll cost. However, <laughs> if those members are receiving any of the retirement or sick leave or healthcare benefits, those types of things they could use to calculate towards what is their payroll cost. With that lack of uh, cl clarity in mind, would, do you have any guidance that you perhaps may, may want to offer to one of the owners of this LLC as to what he or she should do? Well, one thing you can definitely do is you can work with the lender that you are um, trying to obtain your SBA or the PPP loan through or the SBA directly. Um, the SBA has indicated that they are going to be pushing out guidelines and answers to very specific questions that are coming up as this is being rolled out because there is admittedly some areas that are left unclear. So, I would recommend as a practical purpose right now, at least try to submit the application. However, the applications are actually not yet ready as I'm understanding it. The SBA is still putting that together and we'll get to what you can do in the meantime, but at least try to pull everything together and talk to your lender, talk to your local SBA. Um, I can provide contact information to see if that's an area of clarification that can be um, addressed in the uh, publications that will be coming out basically on a daily basis. Okay, I'm going to try to sneak one more question mm -hmm. in. Um, does the 50 employee threshold still apply to FMLA plus? Um, as it relates to FMLA plus related, I mean, that's a different situation than the PPP or the CARES Act. This might be a question that's better addressed to Claire. 
Um, Cause I think that's more of a, a, an employment issue. Okay. And does Claire want to, Claire, you can chime Claire. in by all means. Michael, can you repeat that question? Yes. Um, the question uh, is, uh, does, quote, does the 50 employee threshold still apply to FMLA plus, close quote? And an employer who has fewer than 50 employees can be exempt. If you recall that slide I put up with all the different yeah. categories, they can be exempt from FMLA plus, but they have to request that exemption. Got it. Thank you. Okay, back to you, Melissa. Thank you. Sure, no problem. Um, all right, so after you have determined what your dollar amount is that you're seeking to borrow, what can you use the funds for? So the funds can be used for payroll costs on the same um, definitions that we just talked about, employee salaries, commissions, costs related to group health care benefits, again, very important, a rent, a very critical issue that's coming up, utilities, and interest payment on mortgage obligations or other debt obligations that are incurred prior to fe February 15th of 2020. And that date there is very, very critical. What they don't want, they being the drafters um, <clears throat> of this, is people running out and taking on new debt and then trying to obtain PPP funds to uh, offset that. It has to be existing debt obligations prior to February 15th of 2020. Oh, what do payroll costs not include? Both for the purpose of calculating your payroll costs and what you can use the funds for. Uh, this is a critical issue here. The compensation of an individual employee in excess of an annual salary of $100,000 as prorated for the covered period. This question is coming up a lot. Does this mean I'm automatically excluding an employee that makes more than $100,000 annually from any of this? The answer is, very simple answer is no, but you have to prorate it out. So as we're reading it, salaries, you can compute the salary up to the $100,000 for the covered period, um, but then anything after that, no, cannot be included. Certain payroll taxes, uh, compensation of an employee whose principal place of residence is outside the U.S., and then qualified sick leave or family medical leave for which a credit is allowed under the Families First Coronavirus Response Act that was passed this week. What uh, this, the PPP is trying to avoid is receiving double credit for the same expense. That's the main reason for the qualified sick leave um, exemption. Melissa, question from the audience. Yes. Can an employer take advantage of payroll tax deferral and apply for a Payroll Protection Act loan through the SBA or are those remedies mutually exclusive? The remedies are not mutually exclusive, provided that the, the payroll deferments are actually going to be paid. Now, where the issue is, is the payroll, <clears throat> the loans have to be made, or the, I'm sorry, the payments that are going to be made from these PPP loans have to be made during a specifically covered period, which is essentially March through June. And I can give you the exact dates here shortly. So if you're making payments outside that covered period, you don't get the forgiveness portion of the loan, which is the, the um, critical part of this PPP program. So if you're taking the deferment, but you're not paying those deferments until after the cover period, then those would not apply towards your forgiveness portion. So you can still take the money, it's just you will not get that portion of the money reimbursed or forgiven. Thank you. I'm going to sneak one, one more in here and then let, mm -hmm. let you uh, finish up with your presentation. Sure. Uh, follow up, a question from an attendee, quote, uh, follow up. Do the monthly payments to owners get included in payroll for purposes of calculating the 250%? If it's a distribution or a draw or any type of payment that is outside of your standard wages, base salary, then as we're reading it, the answer to that is no. Okay, so, so essentially distribute, pro, pro, distribution of profits to owners is not part of it. Correct. Thank you. Okay, I won't interrupt. 
No, it's fine. I'm fine with the questions. Okay. Sure. <clears throat> okay. So what about the impact of layoffs or salary reductions or furloughs? That's something that unfortunately all these business, all of the businesses are definitely addressing. Um, layoffs, salary reductions, or furloughs do, does not impact your ability to receive PPP loan proceeds or how you use your loan proceeds. However, that will impact the amount of the loan which may be forgiven. And that's the important key factor here is how much of your loan will be fully forgiven. And we want to make sure that everyone who is taking PPP loan funds can maximize the amount that can be wholly forgiven. And yesterday, a lot of our questions were more so, how do I apply? What qualifies? How does this program work? Today, we're seeing a lot more detailed questions about how do we calculate what amount of a loan is forgiven? And this is where it gets tricky. So generally, to calculate how much of your loan is forgiven, you take an amount equal to the amounts actually paid for payroll costs, and those are based on the number of full-time employees. And where that difference from the front of the loan when you're determining your 250% is you can include part-time employees, independent contractors, all those types of categories, but in determining in the amount that's actually forgiven, you only calculate the number of full-time employees. Um, interest payments on mortgages that are incurred prior to that February 2020 date, that amount is wholly forgiven, but not other debt obligations. So if you have a line of credit on your equipment, on your leases, of you know, whatever your equipment might be, um, anything other than an actual mortgage on real estate, those interest payments will not be included in the amount that's forgiven in your loan. Uh, rent and utilities during the covered period, which is defined as the eight week period beginning on the date of the origination of the loan which is the day, not the day you apply, but the day you actually receive the funds. That's the date of the origination of your loan and you snapshot eight weeks moving forward and the rent, utilities, the amounts um, for payroll costs, all those things, you take those amounts, you add them all up and those are the amounts that will be forgiven in your PPP loan proceeds. Now, um, when we talked earlier about the impact of furloughs and layoffs or reductions in salary. How does that impact the amount of your loan that is forgiven? There is a reduction on the amount that is forgiven that relates directly to your workforce reduction or reduction in wages. However, that reduction in wages is only up to 25%. So anything in excess of 25% will be included in um, the amount that is not forgiven, but anything under 25% in a reduction of wages will be included uh, in the amount that is forgiven on your loan. Also, if there is a workforce reduction that occurred between February 15th, 2020 through 30 days after the act, which is now April 27th of 2020, so you take that snapshot and there was people who were terminated or furloughed or whatever during that time period, but they are rehired or their wages are restored by June 30th of 2020, that does not impact the dollar amount um, that is forgiven in the loan. That's like a free period where you can, you know, try to figure out what's best for your company that there won't be any quote unquote penalties for, but that is the time frame um, that we're looking at. However, if there's any terminations after April 27th, 2020, uh, that is not, taken into consideration as to whether or not there is the exemption applied to the loan forgiveness amount. Melissa, I'm going to honor my commitment in the, in the breach. I just got a, a backdoor uh, request, back channel request um, to, to uh, have you answer the following mm -hmm. question and the timing seems perfect. Uh, this was actually a, a question that was emailed to one of our staff members. Quote, can an employer lay off a salaried employee effective immediately and not pay any compensation so that the last day is day of the layoff notice, close quote. And I'm, I'm suspecting based on what you just told us, um, you, you, you could do that, but if you stay with that plan, it's going to have ramifications on your uh, eligibility for, loan, for the loan and loan forgiveness. 
That is correct. However, if that employee was laid off today, <clears throat> but rehired by June 30th, right. then that's not taken to cap into any consideration. So that does not impact your loan forgiveness amount. However, if you lay somebody off on April 28th, we'll say, because that's the 30 days after the, the act was passed, you lay them off on April 28th, it doesn't matter whether or not you rehire them by June 30th or not. That Great. termination will then be applied towards the reduction of the amount that your loan will be forgiven. Great, thank you. And then some more general questions. Uh, how do you apply for the PPP loans? Call your bank or credit union. Online applications will be available on sba.gov. However, they're not online just yet. Uh, the conversations I've had with both lenders and the SBA is they're working hard to get the loan applications in process. Um, as of this morning, they were not yet available, but I expect they will be very soon. But what can you do in the meantime? Well, you can start gathering the information that you will need to apply to the loan for the loan, and that includes your IRS payroll tax filings, payroll reports for the past 12 months, your number of full-time employees, your state income, payroll, unemployment insurance filings, um, and verifications on your lease obligations. Start gathering all that information for the last 12 months because you will need that information to apply for the loan. Likewise, when you are going to seek your loan forgiveness, you have to have documentation supporting your expenses that you actually paid the salaries, you actually paid the rent, you actually paid the mortgage interest um, that you are seeking to apply towards your loan forgiveness. So you must keep all of your documentation and supply it when required. Melissa, I want to, uh, I want to, I want to uh, try to move things along here. I want to get to Brian momentarily, of course, of course. especially because we've got a, a good non nonprofit contingent listening in, but there is another question that I think is timely coming from an employer who wants to know whether any of this is affected by the situation where an employee resigns uh, voluntarily. And will that, have an, uh, will that cause a reduction in the amount of the loan being forgiven? So the way the act is currently drafted, if there's a voluntary separation that is still applied towards the to total numbers that you are supplying to um, obtain your loan forgiveness. There is no carve out for that yet. And I say yet because we're expecting redrafting on a lot of these issues to come out very shortly. And that might right. be an issue that will definitely be addressed. And I don't want to take any more time. There's one other right. quick question that I want to, to address because this comes out a, comes up a lot as well. For the idle loans, economic injury disaster loans that many of our small businesses and nonprofits have already applied for, the question comes up is, because I applied for an idle loan or received funds from an idle loan, am I barred from participating in the PPP? And the answer is no. So with that, I will turn it, it. over to our nonprofit. Wait, did you, hey, I have a question. Did you just see, Is it? were you answering that question because you saw it on the... No, that's a question that I have received oh, you anticipated. 15 times the past. Well, that's yeah. been a key one. You did, you did a great job. Let me, let, me just, let me just make sure that you covered this question and that answer. Um, uh, and this will be the last one for you. Uh, question, this may have been a pr prior question, but if an economic injury application is currently under review, can or should a business also apply for the PPP, PPP loan? So <clears throat> that's a, a, a more detailed answer. Yep. The short answer is yes, you can apply for all of them. They are all independent of each other, although they work together. You're not barred from obtaining proceeds on one loan program um, and obtaining proceeds from another loan program. However, businesses, nonprofits need to look at each of the programs and see which is actually a best program for them. For example, if funds are needed immediately, right now, today, the PPP program, the funds are not going to be available today. They're not going to be available in 14 days. It's just a backlog of information that they have to process through. So some of your more immediate relief comes from the program you just mentioned right there. 
Um, but there's ways to refinance some of these programs into a PPP loan. So I would say still apply for the PPP loan and then work with your lender to see how can I refinance, where do these overlap, how do we get this all sorted out. Um, but the PPP loan programs, it's first come first serve. There's $349 billion, which sounds like a lot, but the SBA is expecting that those funds will go very, very quickly. And once they're gone, as of right now, there's no ability to refund the pot or refill the pot, although the expectation is, is more funds will become available to continue funding this program. Okay, great. I'm mindful of the clock. I'm sure there's plenty that Claire and Melissa can and would be happy to add offline, but we've got to, we've got to transition over to Brian. Thank you very much to both of you. Great. Well, thank you, Mike. First, it's a privilege to be a part of this. And I just want to thank, especially all the attorneys and, and the nonprofit leaders, you know, thank you for your service, because we know many of you are on boards, you're leading your organizations, and boy, is it a challenge right now. Um, and so uh, we really appreciate it. So as Mike had mentioned before, uh, BVU is talking to many nonprofits about their current needs. Um, we have some very specific things that we've heard and we've asked about um, and are helping some consultants come through. And we've even waived some of the consulting fees to just to help nonprofits go through this trying time. But we've asked them three things, like where do they need volunteers? And we know many times volunteers can't work in teams the way they used to in the past, but there may be re remote volunteering work. And some individuals are willing to go into circumstances as long as they're six feet apart and so on. Uh, but we also ask what pro bono consulting help they need. And, um, and then also some donated goods. And we heard 50 different requests come in. So for the nonprofit leaders that are on the phone, if you need anything, please let us know. <clears throat> and I think the other thing, and this is part of the discussion, I think the needs are gonna change coming out of the crisis uh, that we're in right now. We're gonna talk about some of those things uh, at, at this point. So let me um, share a slide deck with you. Brief slides. There we go. Okay. So um, I want to thank uh, you know, Becky and Mike for inviting us to come into this. Um, I think, you know, the one problem we have, which is obvious, no one knows the depth and length of this crisis. And, you know, I've heard a number of people talk about that the coronavirus could hit us in waves. We could peak in May, go down a bit in the summer, come back in the fall. And that's really the uncertainty. And so some of the topics that you see on this list right now are things that are, um, are in view of that and some things you might want to think about as board members and as you're advising your clients going through this process. So Melissa already really covered the SBA loan, but one of the reasons Becky had invited us to, to present to you are some of the points in here, just some details. Like one is for your clients and your nonprofits, make sure they call their bankers today and get, get in touch with them, get on the list to be able to have these SBA loans. Um, we did that ourselves at BVU and have contacted Key Bank and there are other providers that are around, but it's very helpful to do that even though the application isn't out yet. Um, you've already heard about the calculation. I won't go into that. Um, you wanna prepare a statement about how the uh, virus is impacting your organization. And one question that came up for a nonprofit is they're actually doing okay financially now, but over the next couple months, it could hit severely and hamper their revenue streams at that point. That's okay to document that as well. And then finally, uh, get your boards lined up to, uh, to be able to approve the borrowing that's required. Um, the main point here is speed is important in this. Um, you, know, you don't have application fees, fees for these loans, but it's not an unlimited amount of money that is going to be available for people. So that's kind of point number one. Uh, point number two is succession planning. And you know, succession planning, and maybe this is obvious, but I can speak to the nonprofit sector, but only 27% of nonprofits have written succession plans. That's a national statistic. Uh, at BVU, we do a lot of consulting in this space. We've probably uh, done succession for a little over 100 nonprofits in Northeast Ohio. It is something that every organization should have. And if you think about succession planning, there are two elements to it. 
One is the long-term succession if somebody retires or moves on, but the second is interim succession. And as far as the benefits, um, the slide that you have in front of you, uh, it certainly helps the organization be mindful of the leaders they have, do they have the people in the right places, and what's their talent pool look like? Because uh, one statistic that is interesting, in the corporate world, about 70% of CEOs are promoted from within uh, the organization. In the nonprofit world, it's only 40%. It drops down quite a bit because boards might not quite be comfortable with some of the people that are in those in that next level of roles. But, um, but if you do succession planning the right way, you can see the capabilities your internal staff have and then have time to close capability gaps. And that's what's important about management. Uh, and that's an understanding the people that you've got, the risks of the organization, and some of the risk can be even an interim succession. And God forbid, but I think what we're going to see with Corona, some of the senior executives and others are going to all of a sudden disappear. They're going to be sick. And so the question is, are you able to kind of manage the responsibilities that they have with the people that you have? And for people, for the individuals, it really stretches them and helps them think about what they need to do to step up to the next level. Now, specifically for Corona, uh, what we recommend is you list, I would say, five to even 10 of the most important elements that a person has in their job. And then identify who on your staff, or it even could be other people, because some nonprofits are pretty small and they don't have large staffs to uh, handle the responsibilities. But who can step in on each of those various responsibilities to, uh, to make sure it's covered? And when they do that, they have to know the resources that are required. Do they have the documents that are needed to uh, carry on processes? Do they have the passcodes to access uh, documentation and get into databases or what have you? Um, you know, who are the contacts, the attorneys, the accountants, all the people that the senior management interfaces with as well as all of your stakeholders? You ought to be able to be very mindful of that and have that documented. And then try to have at least one other person um, you know, in each area, in each functional area. So if somebody does disappear, somebody else can step up and do it, and you don't have all your eggs in one basket. And so communication on all that is, is really, really important. All right, scenario planning. Now it's interesting. I think a lot of people um, have been doing this, a lot of organizations have been doing it. So maybe it's very obvious, but in periods like this, because we don't know the length and depth of the virus, um, we have to be prepared. And one of the most important parts of, of scenario planning, you can plan what you're going to do depending on your revenue streams, but then how are you gonna know that? Do you have the sensitivity analysis to know when your revenue is, is decreasing? So this is an example of scenario planning. You know, number one, your organization may have to freeze wages. Number two, utilize a portion of cash reserves or for nonprofits, an endowment, if such a thing is available. You know, how are you going to carve into that a little bit? And this would be more, maybe more board restricted funds because BVU has an endowment, but it's really a board restricted funds where funds can be released with a two thirds vote of the board. Um, pure endowments really can't do that. The corpus is, is held, um, you know, and you, you really can't tap into it. Then you get into questions of like, do you need to furlough staff? Does the CEO take a pay decrease? Then does the, next, the staff take a pay decrease after that? Then you get into workforce reductions and it was permanent or temporary. So, I mean, this is an example of how you can step down. And I can tell you it, at BVU, like right now, even playing with uh, planning for the um, coronavirus, we have three scenarios that we've reviewed with our, our board. One is if we have a 10% reduction in revenue, one is a 20% reduction, one's a 30%, and the 30% is more permanent. So we're going to be using cash reserves at the beginning, you know, for the 10%, 10 uh, the endowment as we get into the second scenario, and then we have to uh, address headcount when we get into the third scenario. But we've gone through every revenue item that we have at BVU and looked at what the potential is on each one of those things and uh, in order to plan it out. But what we're going to be watching is, and this is the important part, is the cash coming in and how is it being impacted? Because we were guessing how it's gonna be impacted, but we're not gonna know. And that'll tell us the levers that we have to pull. And the um, real benefit of the SBA loan and the potential forgiveness is that buys basically two months of expenses 
uh, for a lot of uh, a lot of nonprofit organizations you know, depending on salaries and so on, which is really really positive. Hey, Brian, can I can I interject? I'm going to bundle a couple of questions that sure. um, have come in, in your in your bailiwick. Um, uh, two people are inquiring about the application of um, some of these protections to uh, uh, 501c6 organizations. I can't tell specifically what organization. I think that's like a not a nonprofit, like a chamber of commerce, or it is, or right. something like that. And the question is: Is that organization eligible for uh, payroll protection? Is that type of an organization eligible for uh, economic injury disaster loans and things like that? Yeah, um, so I I don't know for sure. I don't think so because I've heard of the it's the five hundred one c threes and five hundred one c nineteens. Right, are, they're specifically referenced in the acts. Yeah, I've not seen c sixes being referenced in the act. Okay, and in terms of the disaster loan, I'm not certain as much about that. Maybe some others on the phone you know might know. Thank you. Okay. So one thing I wanted to uh, alert you to, BVU has a free webinar that's coming up. Um, and this is, this is a group called Risk Alternatives. Uh, they're a national organization, they're out of Washington, DC. And they're helping uh, us to really kind of coach nonprofits through some of the scenario planning that we're talking about. Um, and it's, it's one that to me looks like a, it could be very helpful. So we're doing it uh, on Friday at 11 o'clock, it's free. And uh, we invite you all to register for that. Um, the other thing that I would mention to you is um, <coughs> mergers and acquisitions, M&A work. You know, when, the, when you get into a poor economy, and this happened in 2008, uh, it often forces mergers in uh, the nonprofit organizations. Now, BVU happens to be in the consulting world where we do a lot of feasibility studies for mergers. And I shouldn't even say a lot because the economy has been pretty good. And we don't push these things. It's more when nonprofits come to us, we help them through it but we'll effectively uh, help them think about what programs they're gonna offer if two organizations are coming together. What's the uh, governance look like, the board structure? We'll do three year pro forma financial uh, forecasts. We'll help them with their org design and so look at some of the HR elements of an organization. Um, and I, we're guessing, even though it hasn't happened yet, there are gonna be a number of nonprofits that'll be considering combinations. So if you're a board member, the one piece of advice is you'll want to do this early because a merger partner is in, of interest if they have decent cash reserves and that type of thing. I've seen some organizations try to get into it at a point in time, they bled through cash reserves and no one wants to merge with them. The other thing is when you do feasibility studies, it doesn't mean you're signing up for a merger. It's just looking at, the, at what it could look like, the combined organization, and that's the beauty of it. So if your board has any inkling of doing this, if you, you know, looking at the tea leaves and feeling there could be pressure and this might be of interest, explore it early would be the point. Uh, and with, with the other merger partner, there's no harm in, in doing it. So those are some other elements, Mike, I just thought people might want to think about. And by the way, this is for the nonprofits and for for-profit organizations. Yep, Brian, Stop. thank you for that. Um, some of the comments and uh, uh, in response to my question of you regarding 501c6 is we've got an attendance member who has said there is a one sheeter out there. I haven't seen it that does specifically reference a 501c6. Uh, I'm, I'm mentioning this because I had multiple inquiries on 501c6s about which I know. Uh, very, very little. Um, right. And then the same individual supplied a um, helpful link to um, for folks who are interested in this issue to check. It's, it's www.thepowerofa.org. Um, uh, um, so thank you to uh, the individual who supplied that information. Great. Good. Um, if I could just Chime in very, very quickly. <clears throat> yeah, please. Sure. Uh, let me see here. So <clears throat> hopefully, can you see my screen or no? Yeah, you're good. Do you see the US Senate Committee on Small Business and Entrepreneurship? We do. Okay. 
There are two um, pieces of information that are being circulated that address a lot of the questions that are coming up today. Here I'm showing you one of them. It's the U.S. Senate Committee on Small Business and Entrepreneurship, Entrepreneurship excuse me, put up by Senator Ben Cardin. Um, and it talks about a lot of the um, issues we are discussing today. And it also talks about the different types of programs that are available. As you can see here, there's the PPP loans. It talks about um, the debt relief programs for SBAs, the EIDL loans, the grants. It talks about 501c3s. Um, so this might be a good piece of information. And there's also the small business and entrepreneurship U.S. Senate Committee, they also distributed yesterday um, a piece of information that could be helpful. And we can certainly make these available to all the attendees. Thanks. That's great, thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, go, I, we've actually done a decent job of addressing uh, a fair number of the questions that are out there before I, ask the last uh, couple of questions, hopefully in the time we have remaining. I want to assure our attendees that if you think of a question hereafter that you wanted to ask but failed to get in while the panel was assembled, you can email your questions to our, our wonderful um, CEO at the CMBA, Becky McMahon. I'm going to give you her email address and she will route the, um, the question uh, appropriately. It's R McMahon, R M C M A H O N, at cleemetrobar.org. I'll spell that C L E M E T R O B A R.org. So, and Michael, they can see that in the chat right now. I've posted I, her email there. Great. Thank you. Thank you for doing that, Michael. Okay. Um, the uh, we have we have a long-standing question up on our Q and A, um, asking is the five hundred eleven dollars a day gross or net? Anybody want to take that? The five hundred eleven dollars would be gross. Okay. Is next is I'm going to try to get through them rapid fire. Is eligibility affected? by things like unpaid child support or back tax debt. In other words, someone who's in financial distress. Uh, the DOL has not addressed that in their FAQs. Great. Um, next question uh, relates to the interest rate on the pay payroll protection loans and will that vary by bank? Uh, the loan interest rate cannot exceed 4% and it's determined by the SBA. I do not believe it varies by bank, but I can certainly get an answer to that and supplement that because I do not want to give wrong advice on that. You know, one, one thing I did here is that if, if you take the uh, payroll forgiveness uh, grant and let's say you have a loan that goes on top of it, you'll... I just know that Key Bank is keeping the loan at prime um, for a period of time. Then, after one year, go to the market rate after twelve months. But that's one bank that's that's saying that. Right. And the PPP program, the terms of that loan are ten years, and you're locked into interest to not exceed four percent. Now, as it relates to below four percent, that I, I just don't have that information. Great. All right. Well, um, uh, part of my job as moderator is to also be timekeeper, and I'm mindful of the fact that an hour goes by very, very quickly online, especially with great presenters like this and great audience participants like this. So we are going to conclude the program. I want to thank everyone who attended. Uh, again, I want to thank the CMBA for its uh, tremendous leadership in, in putting programs like these uh, together, especially under such circumstances. Um, and I especially want to take an opportunity to once again thank Claire and Melissa and Brian. You all did an awesome job uh, uh, under uh, very difficult circumstances, and we all are deeply appreciative. So with that, I hope everybody has a, a great day and stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thank you all. 
Thank you, Mike. My pleasure.